Hey, Changemakers, welcome back to another episode of the Engage for Good podcast. I'm your host, Allie Murphy. Any of you that know me know that I love all things leadership and leadership development. So this is a really exciting episode for me. This is part two of our leadership series, where we bring you insights, tips, and stories from three social impact leaders who have made their mark in the business and nonprofit sectors. The last episode, I chatted with Artis Stevens, president and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of America. In just a minute, I'm gonna chat with Kevin Martinez, VP of Corporate Citizenship at ESPN. And you'll wanna come back for our next episode, which will be with Julie Breckenkamp, Vice President of National Strategic Partnerships at Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Each of these leaders offer their advice. They share the mistakes they've made, discuss how they take care of their well-being and support their teams, as well as what's on the horizon in our field. In just a minute, you'll hear from Kevin Martinez about his leadership journey at ESPN and before that. As VP of Corporate Citizenship, he oversees all aspects of the company's citizenship initiatives, including corporate giving, volunteerism, cause marketing, and sustainability. As an industry veteran, Kevin is responsible for ESPN's strategic programs that enable both greater access to sports and leadership through sports. He leads ESPN's sponsorship of Special Olympics, which has helped more than 1.6 million athletes teammates and coaches join the unified sports movement. He also manages ESPN's ongoing collaboration and fundraising efforts with the V Foundation, which have generated nearly a hundred million towards cancer research program. On top of all of that, Kevin and ESPN received the 2023 Golden Halo Award for Business, which is our highest honor for companies and causes engaged in activities that build a better world and the bottom line. This episode is packed with valuable insights and tips for anyone interested in leadership and social impact. And you'll learn a lot about Kevin's leadership journey and the impact his work has had on ESPN. In today's episode, we'll explore how he took traits that could have really held him back and turned them into strengths, what he's learned along his leadership journey, how he focuses on his well being, why culture eats strategy for lunch or for breakfast. The trends CSR and social impact pros should be paying attention to, his advice for those looking to grow in their careers and make it into a leadership position, what he'll be talking about at Engage for Good in May. Come join us, there's a link in the show notes, and so much more. And with that, let's get started. Hey, Kevin, welcome to the podcast. Well, hello, Ali. It's good to see you. Um, uh, you know, I haven't been able to uh, see you directly, so I'm on my phone talking to you. It's great. <laughs> well, I'm excited that you're here, and I'm also looking forward to meeting you in person in Atlanta in May, which we'll talk about shortly. Yes, the Engage for Good conference. I hope everyone comes. Uh, we're so excited to be uh, being honored with the Golden Halo. So we are all more than what we do for work. So tell us a little bit about the personal and professional journey that led you to become the VP of Corporate Citizenship at ESPN. Wow, it is a journey. I'm a man of a certain age, so I've got a long <laughs> history, so I'll try to keep it concise. Um, but I'll, I'll start with a couple of milestones. One is uh, my family grew up with not a lot of means, um, and my dad joined the military, and he uh, joined as a a uh, deep sea diver had never seen the ocean. Oh. Um, and we got moved to Hawaii when I was one years old. And um, he, you know, was just an amazing, he is an amazing dad that provided us uh, resourcing, but he was gone all the time. He was on super secret missions and he trained Navy SEALs. But the cool part of it was I was in Hawaii. So I grew up in a, a Pacific Asian Islander community. I am Hispanic. I am Native American. Uh, my mom is Irish and Norwegian. I've got a little bit of everything in me. So the perspective there is really great. I say that because it is kind of the tone of the rest of my life. I mm -hmm. uh, you know, went to Bradford High School when Obama was at Punahou. Uh, we played against uh, President Obama in basketball. Uh, I went on to the University of Washington, um, uh, majored, I was going to major in medical science uh, oh. research, and I decided that that was not the place for me. <laughs> uh, I was great. I was great in the uh, hard sciences, but not so great in the math and some of the things around it, uh, but went on to communications and sociology as my minor. 
and uh, graduated University of Washington, 1983. I was a college cheerleader, so you can see oh, a little nice. bit of uh, emphasis of uh, you know team spirit in me. Mm-hmm. Uh, hence, foreshadowing sports. Um, and then uh, was lucky enough to work in the community. I waited tables for a number of years, um, trying to pay off my debt, uh, and then got a job uh, in local government uh, in community relations. Then I was asked by the city council to help run the Seattle Aquarium. So there's a oh, sidestep for you. Did that for a while. I was loving that because of my growing up in Hawaii. Um, and then, uh, you know, worked with, uh, the governor and the county executives, uh, in those, uh, areas, and then got a call by this amazing company called Eddie Bauer to help do public affairs. Yeah. You know, that, that great down coat. Um, and, uh, I went in to do public affairs and they gave me sustainability, our corporate giving programs. We used to big, huge United Way program. This was back in early, early, late eighties, early nineties. Um, and so that's when corporate social responsibility hadn't really become a practitioner. Uh, my job is to bring those together. Then I got a call by Starbucks because there were a lot of things going on with World Trade Organization being held in Seattle. Uh, I helped them. I built out their community program. Uh, one of my you know, prideful moments, my hubris is that I helped bring Ethos Water to Starbucks to help pay for um, the work, the true first cause marketing asset. Uh, and then got a beautiful call from Home Depot to be the president of their uh, foundation and, and the vice president of their community affairs team. Um, lost my job when the CEO left, which is going to happen a lot in any course in action for our, our peers out there. Uh, and then got a call by KPMG in New York. And I was like, okay, I'm going to switch lanes. I'm going to totally be in the financial industry. And guess when I did it? Right around 2008. Oh, that <laughs> so, sounds like a whole lot of fun. Timing is everything, right? No kidding. Um, so went to Lehman Brothers, was there for, or excuse me, I went there to KPMG. We lost Lehman Brothers in 13 months. And so I was out of a job. And then I got a call by a headhunter for a job at Disney to run mm-hmm. their foundation. Uh, at the time, I did not get the job. I was number two, I think. Okay. And then about two weeks later, I got a call saying, do you like sports? Because we have this other organization called ESPN. And I was over the moon happy. And that's kind of how I got to where I am. I love it. Okay, we're going to dive into a couple of these pieces as we go along. But before we get there, listeners know I'm a huge fan of lessons learned, a growth mindset. How do you how have you gotten to where you are today? So we all make some mistakes and we learn things along our journey. <laughs> what is one of your favorite mistakes or lessons learned? And is it what did you learn from it? And is it something that you still apply today? Well, Ali, you can see my ear to ear grin, but no one else can because <laughs> I've made a lot of them. Um, Tell us I a think story. Part of, <laughs> yeah, part of it is understanding how to take them in and not them not let them punctuate your career in ways that are negative. Uh, the first major one that came to mind when I was looking at this um, is that I am very careful about how I communicate in the written word because uh, that is forever. Uh, either on social media or email or when anything you're putting out there and being conscious of um, how you're communicating and who your audience is. And so wh- one of the big mistakes I made early on uh, was at Starbucks, actually. And um, I was trying to do my due diligence on a grant and found out that I thought there were some really concerning issues with the, the charitable organization from a governance perspective and accounting perspective. But it just so happened to be one of the favorite charities of a guy who founded the company. And I decided to uh, su- suggest that it was the wrong direction. And I was so much in the heat of the moment of being right that I made a huge mistake and sent the email to the organization and not to Ooh. my chairman. And that Ooh. was one of the first moments of like, uh, like I thought I was going to lose my job. Um, and I did not. And he came back to me and said, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but we won't really want to help them grow. And so I learned from that. But from that mistake, I learned that there was a, a perspective that um, I didn't see, even though it was an executive prerogative perspective. Mm-hmm. It was in our strategy, et cetera. But the reason I bring that out is because it is imperative in our line of business to make sure that you are crystal clear on who your audience is, how you're talking to them. And the vernacular changes, the narrative changes between those, and to make sure that you have a very good construct of that moving forward. Mm-hmm. 
I think that's, oh my gosh, I love this story on so many levels. And also who you started with, part of this career journey is making those mistakes, taking them in, and then not letting them punctuate your career in a negative way. One thing that I was thinking about as you're talking about sending this email, I once, oh no, I actually had a, I had a rowing coach in college who sent an email to an entire parent listserv that shouldn't have gone out. Long story short, the little lesson that I learned from that other than pay attention to what you're writing is now when I send an email that is not routine or is a little bit sticky or something that I want to ponder on and figure out, I will remove the name or the email address of who I'm sending it to until it's ready to send. Then I review it. I stick the names back in so I don't accidentally send the thing either. It's so smart. And I do that all the time. Also, when I don't know how to spell someone's name, I'll open up another email (laughs) and find it. I think we all do that. You know, those are very tactical, but I think the, the broader macro piece of that is being very thoughtful about as the process communication happens Mm -hmm. and whatever the distribution platform is, is to be very conscious of who your listener is and the the structure of how you're moving it forward. Absolutely. Okay. So one of the biggest challenges our community faces and something we talk about on the podcast a lot is gaining leadership buy-in. How would you advise listeners to do this? And is it the model that you followed as you were rising through the ranks? So I have to tell you, I, I am, and I, and I think our good friends at Engage for Good know this. Um, I'm a little bit of an anomaly in a, in a lot of spaces. At least I was early on, because I am not a purist. I don't believe that my function is to help society be better. Uh, I don't believe it is whole and part and parcel just to make a better reputation for our company. I think it is an amalgamation, a hybrid of that. So it demands cause, you know, uh, uh, do right, do well, right? So to to do this job, we have to do right by our company first. Our resources come from our company. Even if you have a charitable foundation, the fact is, is it's being fed by the relationships of the company, the brand, the, the brand love, our consumers, everything else. So I, I, I come with a very strong business acumen. I know my business. I know it backwards and forwards. I could tell you distribution and merchandising techniques at Home Depot. I could tell you about how coffee is sourced and made at Starbucks. I could tell you about, you know, uh, partner engagement at the local level and customer service. Those things are really critical. And so for me, what I always start with is a is understanding what the business priorities for the company are. And then I will build a strategy with my team that is focused on those that highlights and brings in the opportunity to raise all boats in our community and with our employees and with our sports fans. But it it draws back to our five priorities, you know, and we know what they are and that's how we measure things. So that's the first thing. And I learned that also from Bob Nardelli, who is my CEO at Home Depot, you know, who came from the Jack Welch School of Business. Um, And it was very clear that this needed to be, you know, an, another tool within the arsenal of business. It wasn't separate then. And and the problem is, is that if it isn't, it becomes episodic, it becomes insular, and it becomes something off to the side, and you do not want that. Mm-hmm. I think that's such a good point that, well, one, tying it to business goals and your five priorities or pillars, I think is what you said. And even if you're lower down on that list of kind of the the hierarchy of an organization, tying it to those or also knowing what's important to your immediate leader can make a difference too. Because if you're tying something to their goals, their KPIs, and what they need to deliver higher up, I think you're going to be more successful. Yeah, you know, and 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 the basic fundamental of your question is leadership. And so, you know, I, every listener will know that every, every, every manager, uh, leader of a corporation will say, don't be all things to all people, Mm -hmm. but I really want you to do this, which is not in the corporate giving guidelines, right? So understanding functionality and how it builds back is also a tool to be able to respond to that. But when it's executive prerogative is to be able to say that's a license to operate opportunity, right? So it's, it's really knowing your business and your, and your leaders and socializing that and then moving it forward to your team. Okay, so we're going to take a little bit of a step away from kind of advice, and we're going to come back to it later, but we're going to detour for a second and say, what are some of your big objectives in the coming year? So we have, um, as I told you, we have priorities for the company. I'm going to tell you what they are, 
Uh, so it's expand the audience. It's um, direct to consumer, as you, I'm sure you've heard of ESPN Plus and Disney Plus. Um, it is innovation. It's looking at our technology, but also new ways to tell stories. Remember, we're a 24-7 news outlet. And it's the storytelling asset, which are outcomes, not impacts necessarily. I always tell our nonprofits, boy, if you can give me impacts, that's great. But if you can tell me what it did, that's a story, right? And the fifth is our DE&I strategy, which is you know, an essential for every corporation to make sure that it's part of the fundamental uh, building blocks of what we're doing. So in that, what we've decided to do is stay with our corporate giving strategy, which is access to sport for youth, which is expand the audience. Youth are opting out of sports at a higher rate than ever before. The pandemic did not help. Social justice is not helping. And so, you know, if you're not a sports, if you're not playing sports or doing something by the fifth grade, it is something like 60, 70% less likely you will be a sports fan. Well, if you're not a sports fan, you're probably not watching our networks, right? So we got to be really smart there. So we talk to our strategy teams about that. Empowerment and leadership through sport is our second area. So we are focused in on like, if you're not an athlete, but you want to be in the sports space, what can you do with the empowerment that you have? Our work with the Women's Sports Foundation is really critical because it is teaching young girls that they have a place in sports. Body image is always such an issue for young girls, the ability to you know, create a community around it. Um, you know, for young black girls, um, their hair is a big issue for uh, young Hispanic girls. Uh, the quinceañera is a, another piece that is very like they become part of the, the, um, fabric of their local family and they opt out of other things. How can we bring them back in? So those types of things, we keep that strategy. So our big three goals this year are going to feed those. And so we have a return to play program, which is to get particularly black and brown kids back into sports who are going to be fully underrepresented and under-resourced. So 60% of our access funds are going in that direction. It also expands the audience. It helps us with our DEI strategy and it's innovative and great stories. The other piece is that we have the Choose Kindness Project, which is something we launched two years ago uh, and now has become this wonderful asset, which is helping kids create the futures that they imagine. And our area is through sports. ABCs is through technology and entertainment. And that's dealing with bullying, intentional inclusion, and youth mental wellness. And the third piece is that we are the the founder of the V Foundation for Cancer Research. We've helped raise millions of dollars for cancer research. It's a fundamental citizenship initiative for us. It's a cultural carrier for us. This is the 30th anniversary. We just announced $15.5 million raised at our V Week in December. So we do that during December and during the ESPYs. So we're building our strategy for the 30th for the ESPYs. I love it. Okay, so you've given us kind of an overview of what you're looking at, what you're doing in the coming year. I want to change directions a little bit. You're coming to Atlanta. This is the Golden Halo Award. You're going to speak main stage. Give us a little bit of a teaser about what you're going to talk about. Ah, uh, well, you know, my colleague David Heskell has watched my <laughs> career go up and down many, many, many times. Um, it is not certainly a linear path. Um, I think that part, I know that part of the reason we are being honored is is because of the what I can bring to the table on my successes and failures, but as it relates to not being your, um, I'm, I'm a disruptor. I, 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 I was born with, um, what I think is a strong need to, uh, be a devil's advocate and be truth serum. Um, how you do that is really critical, but what I hope to engage, uh, the, our conference goers with, is a an ability to understand how to be a disruptor, but be a positive disruptor to allow for other peoples to take on your ideas and Im help you implement them, but also to challenge ourselves to not be so focused on being so linear that we forget that creativity and innovation is what makes every company, everyone will say that, great and fabulous is to look for those opportunities. I am very excited to listen to your uh, your talk. This is going to be a good one. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so. I, I think so. It's going to be great. <laughs> so your job sounds like a really exciting one. And I'm guessing that you, it's probably challenging too. So how do you prioritize your well-being and take care of yourself so that you can keep moving this really important work forward? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, 
I believe that I'm an empath, meaning that I my superpower is uh, understanding, you know, how people feel, what the world brings to us, uh, and that's a strength of mine as as long as as well as being kind of a Type A personality and getting things done. So it's kind of that Myers Briggs right in the middle piece. But what what I have figured out is over this pandemic, over social injustice over the financial issues, over the political systems, over, you know, just people trying to keep their families together. I lost my mother to COVID during the pandemic. Um, And so I thought I was very different than everybody in the weight that I was carrying. And I thought my job kept me from, not kept me from, but created a barrier for me being too personal in this because everybody in our role I think gets constantly this, is that what you want to do? Or is that what the company should do? That the people try to personify and personalize our strategy. And so I've kept a barrier at at that. And I actually told my president the, about, uh, uh, about two months ago, uh, he said, how are you doing? You know, I'm, I'm asking all my, my direct reports this. And I said, I, I'm not doing well. I I'm really struggling. Not everybody can say that it it takes courage. It's hard. It's hard. And, and part of it was, I really felt like all the good work we were doing wasn't actually affecting change. And I knew that it was. But when you have to deal with it every single day, and you hear about homelessness, and you hear about food, and you're, you're trying to stay in your lanes for strategy, but you know, there are bigger issues in the black and brown communities. And you know, we're just trying to get kids back in sports. And we're hoping that that will snowball into, you know, equity and leadership it was just too much. And so what I tell people now is that, you know, I'm learning that the wellness piece is that everyone is literally carrying very similar loads is to find commonality and what those are appropriately. So, but be empathetic about what you don't know and try to see how you can build community around that because we're all carrying very similar issues and opportunities, I think. Absolutely. And you're never going to know unless you. it takes courage and it takes a culture of psychological safety and a trust with the people around you. But we all have things that we carry that no one knows about just by, well, typically a lot of people don't know about just by looking at us. Yeah. I mean, the word out there now, you know, there's always these words that come up and pop for business is, is the word trauma is starting to come in, right? Where it was very much a mental wellness piece. And now we're looking at trauma for youth or trauma related to the mer- recent murders in Memphis. I mean, all of this stuff is affecting, you know, 65% of elite athletes in the United States, professional athletes are people of color, right? So this really resonates within the communities for which our most amazing goats are coming from right that it's it's a it's it's a it's part of what we need to 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 think about so that trauma piece is you know is a word that i'm trying to learn how to use and then how to how it can affect change and trauma is such a very large topic but one of the things that i think i learned maybe last year is it's not just individual trauma either well there's also community collective but there's also generational trauma that people are starting to talk about and how there's actually science-backed evidence of how that cascades through generations and things that you can do to start shifting that. We could probably have a whole topic on that, but I wanna, I'm going to oh, bring us back around a little <laughs> okay. bit because I could go down the rabbit hole here. You could be my therapist. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know if I have that skill set, but we could definitely talk about some things. So you talked about the pandemic a little bit, but coming out of the pandemic, we've seen a huge shift in this need to take care of or this more visual need of taking care of our employees and what Americans expect from organizations, both corporate and nonprofit. For example, 44% of a company's total score on the Just 100 that came out recently is made up of employee-related issues like paying a living wage and work-life harmony. How do you create an environment where your team can show up as their best selves? Well, I'm going to use an overused metaphor or saying But I'm telling you, it is absolutely true, and everybody knows it. Culture eats strategy for For lunch. Ah, for lunch. I haven't heard that one. Yeah, I I never have. I never have breakfast. (laughs) Okay, there we go. Um, So, the the important piece of this is that 
Culture is imperative for any organization to thrive and survive, right? It creates community. It creates like-mindedness. It creates differentiation. It creates the ability to bring your whole self to work. It allows for us, if we're going to personify companies, which we do now, then it demands that. It demands personality. It demands, you know, uh, difficulty. It demands the conversations that we would have at the water cooler and also in the boardroom, right? They need to be similar conversations to a large degree. So that that I think is really, really important. I, I am a believer that the type, you need to find the culture that fits you. Uh, I have done a lot of great jobs in CSR, but the culture hasn't always been best for me, even though I've been able to succeed at them. I'll, I'll admit, when I worked at Home Depot, I loved the job. I could tell you about wood, wood sourcing and low VOC paints and light bulbs and merchandising and how the tsunami affected the supply chain, but it, I was not culturally engaged in that whole business. And and I, I didn't thrive in it in the way that I think I could have or should have. It also didn't allow for necessarily my type of leadership. So my type of leadership is servant leadership. I like to get behind the people. My job is to make other people successful using the unique resources that we have and to really stand aside and let them fail and succeed and learn from that. Um, and I don't believe crisis is something, you know, that you should get energy from. I just don't believe that. And too many internal organizations thrive on crisis. And I'm, I'm going to try not to be disparaging to any one department, <laughs> but when your whole world is set around trying to manage communications around what's wrong as opposed to what's right, that's not going to help your brand. That's not going to create brand love, right? That's not proactive engagement. So what I, I've i come to ESPN, and that is very much the culture here. And it is a it is a culture of winning and doing it right with ethics. And so to me, that those, the servant leader, the governance of ethics and responsibility to look at the resourcing, to, to, to want to be best and celebrate and win, those things are really critical. And when you say resourcing, what do you mean by that? You know, each company is different when, you know, I'm going to use what I know. So I apologize. When I was at Starbucks, we had lots of financial resources because Howard really believed in that culture and culture carriers are partners. We needed to get resourcing to our partners, which were our store employees. Um, and so, you know, our uh, Make Your Mark program, which was volunteer program, our um, Cup Fund, which is Caring Unites Partners, which is helping them in times of struggle. Our foundation, which was helping create local community, third places and engage people, and let people come in to, to really create at the time it was literacy because we wanted book clubs and the, you know, the Starbucks, all that stuff. It was really managing the resources that they had financially, but everybody wanted coffee. They wanted free coffee. They'd call <laughs> and say, could you make sure, you know, and that's not what we get here at ESPN. I would say that our our product is media. It's telling the story, right? And it's torn in a really emotional and relevant way and statistically correct and right and journalistically, you know, credible, right? So f- most people want earned media. They want that story. For for our employees, it's making sure that they are affecting the change in corporate responsibility. They're being paid the reasonable salary for it, which our company does. Uh, we look out at their, their safety and well-being. We travel a lot in what we do. So during the pandemic, we took care of our people. It was our first priority. But that resourcing really is d- definitive as to also what people are asking for, not just what you have in your bucket. Okay, we could dive down that train for a while, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring us back once again. I'm going to try and stay on track here. So I'm curious about trends in this space. A lot has changed in the last, I mean, even just the last two months, last year, three years. What trends do you think our listeners should be paying attention to in CSR and social impact? All right. So this is one where I think we can get really serious for the moment and say that part of our job are to be future casters, is to really look at foreshadowing and what the future is going to be, because we have to build programs that will respond to crisis, to the changing environment, to disasters, to social justice that will allow for those to fall within our ability to respond, right? Uh, Reactively and proactively. So it's really critically important that we are not the master of many, but we are very aware of the many issues that are out there. 
I think a lot of my colleagues um, get pressured to be one dimensional. And we really need to be able to push back and say, listen, this may not be my form of business or this may not be our corporate giving area. We don't do a lot of work in homelessness, but it's absolutely critical that I understand what homelessness means upon the systems where we go into market, whether it's a Super Bowl, if you've been right. to Portland, Oregon lately, I live you'd in bed. be absolutely, yeah, you'd be fundamentally surprised for your listeners who drive through and see miles of campers and tents and it was happening in Seattle, right? How does that affect the community? How does it affect, you know, building baseball fields versus homelessness or whatever else it is? We need to understand those. The other piece I would say is, I think there is a concern, and I'm using my words carefully here, on words that we use that are being weaponized, right? And I think, and I don't mean that politically, I mean in the way to help people, because people say, I want to use this word and not this word. And so you have to, you have to use this word. And we learned that when our with our work with Choose Kindness, when we talked about youth mental wellness, mm-hmm. right? Wellness to us meant a broader perspective. As opposed to mental health. As opposed to mental okay. health. And there were different groups throughout the global environment that we're telling us, no, you have to say it this way. You have to do it this way. But if we had the common definition and there were shared values and there were shared outcomes, we, we realized we were saying the same thing in just in different different terms, right? But we what we can't have and we need to is fundamental champions of social responsibility is to make sure that we're using the words that the communities that we're trying to assist. It's like, the, you know, communications or community relations 101 don't go in and tell people what they need no right you go in and ask what is happening in your community tell us what that means use your words and let's talk about that then you derive from that your ability to be able to hopefully respond Mm -hmm. what one two or three take your pick but what one two or three pieces of advice would you give your former self related to making it into a leadership position I'm going to ask all the listeners to Wikipedia or Google if everyone's <laughs> going to laugh. I'm a sci-fi fan, so let's start there. Um, Dune's Litany of Fear. Dune's okay. Litany of Fear. Okay. Yes. It's a basic fundamental kind of, it's not a poem, but it's, it's almost like um, a mantra about how to let fear go through you and go around you Mm. because it can stop you. And that fear is the great equalizer. It it is job is to stop you, to equalize you, not to let you succeed or move forward. So the first thing I would say is that it took me a long time. Um, You know, I'm, I'm a gay man. I've been with my partner for 33 years that I even let that, I struggled with that. And I, my boss, Gary Locke, who went on to be the ambassador to China I went in and talked to him when he wanted to hire me. And I said, well, I don't know if I can take this job because I don't know if you know this, but I'm gay. And this was back in the day. And I struggled with that. And I, and he was like, and, Mama? <laughs> and it was like, and like, you know, and, and it was a superpower that I could bring to the table that would help the community and everything else. And so that's the first thing is, is to understand what fear is and try not to fall within the reins of it, but look up the litany of fear. Um, I would say to be as, as multidimensional as possible. Um, you know, again, the book by the cover piece is, is how we all open the book. But when you read the first chapter or the appendix or you read the reviews, that's multidimensional. That's an intentional inclusion on your part to figure out what else is at play. Uh, I've told you I grew up in Hawaii. I thought I was Asian. Uh, I'm Mexican, American, Native American. Uh, my mom is very white. We used to call her Hallie, uh, <laughs> meaning white person. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I went to the University of Washington, very Northwest, you know, uh, Western culture. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Hispanic, but I don't speak Spanish. And sometimes that creates problems uh, for me when I go out into community. But my dad did not allow us to speak Spanish because he wanted us to be American, white American, right? And every group has that. But the beauty of what I believe I can bring to the table, maybe not beauty, maybe the opportunity, the resourcing is, is that I have a perspective and it's not a full perspective, but it allows for me to introduce myself, whether I, uh, you know, I collect, you know, sports shoes or whether I collect cards or whether I talk about great athletes and goats, 
I have come in from different perspectives. That that gives me entry. And I would say everybody needs to find their uniqueness and shine with it. The third thing is, is keep a journal. Oh, okay. I just turned 30 on Sunday and I got a journal and I said, so give me, give me your tips because I would like to start this. So I is the I used to have a journal, and then I got so busy I stopped. But I have done so many wonderful things. And I'm at the point now that people have to remind me of the things I did. I'm going <laughs> to be going, I'm blessed. I'm going to the Super Bowl. I'm bringing uh, the Walton Family Foundation and the Entertainment Industry Foundation who've helped us with Choose Kindness. I'm going to, you know, see a Super Bowl. It's not playing my team. You know, Seahawks are my team. But, uh, you know, I've been to seven Super Bowls. I've been to the Olympics. I've been, you know, I've been to great things and I can't remember them all. And so whether it's that for me in sports or whether it's, you know, you're working at a charitable entity or you're a coordinator for a volunteer organization, there are beautiful moments in that that will keep you going. And also, it puts it down. It subscribes it for you. It's not an Instagram post. It's not sharing. It is for you and how you see that. I'll tell you, the, 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 the journals that I did keep, and I don't mean like, you know, my day timer and what I did. I meant like I had a perspective on things. It, I look back on the early ones I did. I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea. I thought that way. And quite frankly, I wish I could think that way. Again. Mm -hmm. So those, those are the three things. I love those. I want to circle back around to something as you're talking about remembering what you did in those beautiful moments. I feel like that's also a really good tool when you're in the moments of going to your leader or even just at home and saying, I'm not in a good place to open that journal back up and flip through and remember some of the, the beautiful moments that you've had and say, OK, there will be more of these going forward. Right. Or the really bad ones and like, let's weigh this. OK, mm -hmm. like I got off a really bad phone call yesterday that I just thought went rotten and it did go rotten, at least for me. <laughs> right. OK. But I'm like, OK. And I just let it ruin my day. And mm -hmm. it, that usually doesn't happen. But, you know, that is if I look back in that journal and I realize my email to, you know, that nonprofit that I started off with. That was probably way worse than this. And I have to keep <laughs> things perspective. in perspective, mm -hmm. not, not own things too heavily. So what is one of the most important attributes that you think today's generation of leaders needs? All right. So I'm going to start with, we just did a town hall for all of our production at what we call Creative Surround, which is all, when you watch ESPN, there's all the stuff that happens around at the studio, the lighting, the directorship, the, you know, the graphic cards. Um, and my boss um, leads that effort as well. And um, I was on a panel to talk about generational thinking. And they asked me because I'm a boomer. And I didn't really <laughs> know that. <laughs> you didn't? I was... I did not know that. Okay. I was born in 61. I thought I was Gen Z. You know, I thought I was our, the, the one that comes afterwards. I thought I was going to, but um, it's till 63, as I found out. But what I've learned is, is the perspective. I mean, I, I started work at Eddie Bauer. We didn't have computers. Um, you know, we didn't have cell phones. The block, huge block cell phones were just coming in. So the, the thing I want our, 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 our great, practitioners to understand is that you you got to dance with the people who brought you to the dance. There are a lot of people out there that have worked really hard in the nonprofit space and corporate, and they don't have all the information. Um, and generationally, you don't know their whole history. Um, you know, so I would say, make sure that we're being really conscious of letting them tell that story and it's not punitive, you know, so if they say something that doesn't necessarily meet your generational narrative, uh, I'm going to use pronouns as an example. We get a lot of people who are confused by that. So they don't use it all because they're so afraid of making the mistake. Whereas then when you do use a pronoun for someone who it's incredibly important to, you have changed the world for that person. You have, you have verified their existence in the world, right? It's a beautiful thing. But so this leadership piece is, from from generational pace, I I communicate. I use yes, I use my smartphone. Yes, I'm on social media, but I don't need another inbox. I don't need another way to communicate that I'm going to have to check my email, my phone, and text are the what I do. But if you call me, I pick up the phone, right? But because that's what I do, when I call my team, I expect them to pick up the phone. I have to manage that a little bit better than I do. 
But I also know that there are other people out there that my team are working with that are of my generation and they're texting them and they're sending IMs. I'm like, that's not going to work for them. So understand that we all need to be a little flexible as we move forward in this incredibly changing, quickly changing world of technology and, and, and respond to the audience for which we want response from, right? And communicate in a way that's going to mobilize them and be catalytic for them. I think that is the perfect place to end. So, Kevin, this has been a wonderful conversation. Where can people learn more about you and ESPN? Well, you can always follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I usually say yes to everything unless someone wants money. Then I just say, <laughs> you know, sorry, I can't do that. But uh, I do. I try to post a lot. We have, you know, our, our citizenship handle at uh, uh, ESPN. Um, backslash citizenship uh, for for what our team does, who, as you know, who do the Herculean work, our Instagram uh, at ESPN Citizenship. Um, and, you know, just, you know, also just make sure that you keep us honest moving forward. That's our goal is to do right, do well, and, and do it in the best way possible. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for joining me, for sharing your story, your personal, your professional, how it all weaves together and your advice with our listeners. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Ali, thank you so much for your very good questions. I hope I wasn't too much there uh, giving you too much because I want to save a little bit for the conference in May uh, and engage for good. Thank you for this this wonderful uh, award for our team. Absolutely. Well, so all of you listeners, you can find all of the links that Kevin mentioned at engageforgood.com in the show notes. And we hope to see you in Atlanta in May. And if not there, then at least on more of the podcast episodes. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. The Engage for Good podcast is produced in partnership with True Story FM, engineering by Pete Wright. Music this week is by Zach Nelson and Rex Banner. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, we hope you'll consider doing just that for our show. But the best thing that you can do to support Engage for Good is simply to share the show with a friend or colleague. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.